Well, hi, guys. It's that time. That's our Bible teaching snippet of the day. Yesterday, I told you I had no idea what I was going to teach, but that God would download to me what he wanted me to teach, and he did. This morning, I was in my bathroom and just spending time with him. You know, he and I are always in this continuous conversation, just the two of us. But he's shown me what he wants me to talk about because there's somebody listening right this very moment that it's a word for them. And it's pretty awesome. I'm really, really pleased that the Father would download this to me to talk about today. But before I get into that, I want to go back to yesterday when I was talking about my first raising someone up and bringing them back to life. I want to take you back to when I was talking about that when the man woke up, uh, when I told him to open his eyes, that I did not know what in the world to do next. And it was partially because, oh my goodness, guys, I have never done that before. And I was just in like, okay, what's next? But did you know that when you just do the Word of God, whether it's laying hands on people, bringing someone back to life, see, I didn't use the word D-E-A-D. -E I don't like using that word, okay? And neither did Jesus, okay? Jesus did not want to tell the boys that Lazarus was not alive, that he was, okay? He just said that Lazarus sleeps. And the reason is Jesus' words were so powerful, okay? His words were faith-filled words full of power. And he did not want to work against himself and against Lazarus by saying that. And they finally were so confused that Jesus had no other choice than to just say, look, okay, in the natural, what the word is, is this. Did you know when my phone is low on power, that's what I say, oh, my phone's out of power, I need to plug it up. Now, look, guys, I'm not perfect, okay, but I do try to watch my words because if we operate in faith-filled words, we have to be wordsmiths, which means we pay attention to what we're saying just like Jesus did. But let me go back to this. Oh, before I go on, and did you know I've heard so many false teachings about how that Lazarus really wouldn't D-E-A-D, -E that he was actually some type of a sleep or whatever, and it's a false teaching that Jesus actually really raised him up back to life. I've heard that from a pulpit. Okay, let me keep going. But what I was saying before I sidetracked on Jesus' words being so full of faith that he didn't want to say that negative thing. Uh, but the first time I raised him, uh, someone from, back to life, did you know I didn't know what to do? And what I was saying is as you do the word, things get easier, whether it's laying hands on people, whether it's talking to them about Christ and what he wants for them and getting them into the kingdom of God. Witnessing is what we call it. Did you know that as you do that, you're not scared to anymore? It's just like driving a car. The first time you get in the car, you're hitting the brake, you're hitting the gas, and sometimes you get them mixed up, <laughs> and you got a guy in the next to you going, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. Uh, so, so when we operate in power like laying hands on the sick, casting out devils, uh, raising people back to life, our experiences will help us not be so scared or unsure uh, or in shock, okay? But anyway, since I was so new at this, Holy Spirit just stepped in and gave me a word for this man, like I was saying yesterday. And he basically told me that the man had a choice to make that he could choose. He said, tell him he can live another 10 years if he wants to. But here's how he's going to get that 10 years. And, and, and I want to remind you of something I taught on two weeks ago. It's in Job chapter 34, verse 23. And you need to write this down. You need to just mark it in your Bible, write it in the front, because you're going to need it. Job 34, 23 says, God sets before man no appointed time that he, the man, should appear before God in judgment. God has not determined every moment of your life. Satan gets to play a part in that because if you submit to him and live like the devil, you can get to heaven quicker. You decide through your own actions, your words, and everything as well. So let me just say this. I want to take you over to Deuteronomy 30, and it's verses 15 through 19, but for time's sake, 
I'm just going to read the last part because God says this twice. I've set life before you two different times. He did it in verse 15. Now we're in verse 19. And he says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and the curse. Therefore, choose life. There it is. He's asking you to make a choice. And if God was in ultra control of everything, you wouldn't have a choice. Now, I want to start this teaching I want to do today. I was praying and worshiping and just spending time with my father. And he gave me something to say. I'm going to just read it because I wrote it down. God said to tell you, I am not putting things on you. That's the enemy. I'm not putting sickness or stress or anything else on them. That is always their enemy, and I am not their enemy. Oh, my goodness, if that's not a word right there. But get this. This is the last thing he said. Tell them I'm trying to put something in them, not something on them. Now, you might want to write that down, too. God is not trying to put something on a person. He's trying to put something in a person. I want to show you something. In 1 Peter, i got to go all the way back here. I've got a lot of scriptures, and I probably won't make it through them. But 1 Peter, it says, Control and discipline yourselves. Be careful, be alert, and pay attention. The devil, your enemy goes about and prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to eat or to devour. Lines up with Scripture, huh? Now I want to take you over to Luke chapter 22, verse 31. This is Jesus. It's in red. I have to read what Jesus said. And Jesus said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. <laughs> and when you are converted, you will be made strong and you will strengthen your brethren. Oh, I love that. Isn't Jesus awesome? So he prayed for Peter that when he resurrected from the grave and Peter was actually born again, that he would be just endued with power and strength and go out and share that with other people. But anyway, that's a different teaching. Now, the next thing I want to talk to you is that in 1 John 4, 4, here's another scripture. My dear children, you belong to and are from God and have defeated, conquered, and overcome them because God's Spirit, now here's the part you want to get out of here. God's Spirit is in you and greater than the devil who is in the world. Greater is in you than he that is in the world. Okay, so I just told you God wanted to get something in you. He wants to get his spirit in you. God wants his spirit in you. He wants to get in you, okay? Now, I've got some more scriptures here. God bless me and hope I can get through this. The second thing God wants in you is his word. So tomorrow I'm going to go through some scriptures telling you about how God wants his word in you and explain that to you. But today I just want to cover part one of his spirit God's not putting things on you. God's desire is to get something in you, and it's his spirit <laughs> and his word so that you can be just like Jesus. As he is, so are we in the world. The more spirit we are of him and the more we have his word in us, the more we're going to be just like Jesus. It's that simple, guys. In Romans, it tells us, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we get to renew our minds, and we get to metamorphosize like a butterfly into something from a moth to a beautiful butterfly because we're transformed through the Word of God. That's tomorrow's teaching. But with that said, did you know it also tells us to be conformed to His image? Now, Romans 8.10 says, But if Christ lives in you, the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. So there's an in you scripture. Let's go over to Ephesians 3.17. And it says, Christ through faith actually dwells, settles down, abides, and makes his permanent home in your heart. Wow. See all the in words? Okay. I'm going to go over to Colossians 1.27. And it says, To whom God willed to be made known 
that is the riches of glory of his mystery among the Gentiles. Here's the phrase, which is Christ in you. Did you get the in you? The hope of glory. Did you know some translations say the hope of his glory? His hope is placed in you because once he puts himself in you, you walk the earth and manifest who Christ is because Christ is in you. Those are my in you scriptures right there. Now tomorrow I am going to pick up and do part two and show you that God does not want to put something on you, but he wants something in you. And I want to mine out a couple of things in scripture about that. But first of all, let me say this before I close today. God is not your enemy. God is not trying to make you sick. God is not trying to take you off this earth. Did you know God's will toward you living lifelong in the land is exactly your will? That's where we all agree. He wants people to live life long in the land, living in their bodies, representing the kingdom of God. He's not against you. He's for you. Scripture says that. Scripture says, I'm always for you and I'm never against you. Did you know? <laughs> Guys, if he's slapping you down and making you sick, he might not be for you. And there we go, making the word of God of no effect in our lives. Listen, I love you so much. And I'm not trying to get on to anybody. I'm trying to edify you and teach you what the Word of God says and more importantly what Jesus the Word says so that you can walk in power and in freedom and walk above the world just like Jesus did. Okay? I love you and I'll see you again right here on Facebook. Bye-bye.